begin. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mikhail Solomon. I'm the director of PRISM Art Fair. Um, I'm really excited to have in conversation tonight uh, two wonderful dynamic women who are um, important um, cultural practitioners in the arts industry, um, both from the Caribbean, from, from Jamaica specifically. Um, and I just want to begin the evening by um, thanking um, our event partners for supporting the work that we've been doing for the past couple of years. Um, I'd like to recognize the Knight Foundation, the Green Family Foundation, the South Florida uh, People of Color. Um, I feel like I'm missing someone. Um, uh, I think um, also uh, the Miami-Dade Department of Cultural Affairs, um, uh, the Greater Miami Visitors and Convention Bureau, and specifically their Art of Black initiative. Um, and um, I will start the evening by giving you all some context um, with bios from um, our panelists today. So we have um, Ms. Tiana Webb Evans um, is an art and design industry professional with two decades of market experience. She is the former communications director of Philips, an international auction house known for its trailblazing program and the founder of ESP Group, a brand strategy and communications agency known for its work in both industries. Tiana is also a writer, the founder of Yard Concept, a cultural platform and biannual journal designed to cultivate consciousness through art and community engagement and on the boards of Project for Empty Space, the Female Design Council, BRIC, and an advisor for the Laundromat Project and the American Association of Museum Curators. And we also have Miss Susie Fredericks. Um, um, Susan is the, um, is the founder, of, founder and director of Susie Wong Presents, the Caribbean scene. Susan Fredericks has worked in the visual arts in Jamaica throughout her life with an educational background in anthropology and film at Goldsmith uh, College. Uh, oh, at Goldsmith uh, College. Oh, sorry. At Goldsmith's College. And um, she has a master's um, in science and environment and development at the University of London. Susan has also worked in the fields of social justice and land resource cultural indigenous rights in both advocacy and education. On her return to Kingston 18 years ago, she formulated and ran the ex exhibitions program at 128 Gallery and High Crow Art Gallery before transitioning right um, transitioning full-time to her online um, platform. Currently a gallerist and art consultant, Susan also advises an, on corporate and private collections and serves on the board of the National Gallery of Jamaica as exhibitions chair. Hey. Yes. Thank you, Mikhail, for the wonderful mm -hmm. introduction. You're welcome. So, um, I'll, I'll just kick it off here. I'm excited to um, be in conversation uh, with Susie. And you know how we end up in this dialogue is basically a number of years ago, I started to have this sort of stirring. And a lot of us who are here in the diaspora tend to want to return home at a certain point. And at that point, um, on that return home and, and sort of investigating um, myself professionally, but as an adult um, in Kingston and, and sort of looking at, you know, sort of the trajectory of um, family and sort of family legacy and, and collectors um, in Kingston, I started to, figure, to wonder what was happening outside of, you know, the confines of these visits. Um, I met with a great friend who is a collector and sits on a number of boards in Kingston. And the first place he took me was to the AC Hotel. And he had to, he was like, you have to see this collection at the AC Hotel. You know, it's in Kingston, it's in St. Andrew, um, gorgeous new property. And I walk in and there is a magnificent survey of Jamaican art. And he proceeds to tell me about this woman, Susie <laughs> Fredericks. Um, you know, for anyone who knows me, that means that long since I've had been, you know, I've been investigating who is the Susie Fredericks. This work, you know, was incredible. 
it kicked off um, an investigation for myself in terms of art historically in Jamaica. Um, and knowing that, or finding out that uh, Susie was going to participate um, in PRISM and Mikhail and I having a longstanding relationship, you know, oh I was insistent on meeting her. I said, Mikhail, you have to introduce me um, to Susie. And, you know, just learning more about her work. Yes, they said 18 years, but you have to understand her 18 years has been um, inclusive, not only of exhibitions spanning, you know, sports to historical works, to pre-colonial works, to the most cutting edge contemporary, but also the auctions um, and the um, sort of inter-island uh, relationships that she's developed. So I'll preface all this by saying that we have a real sort of champion of the Caribbean art today um, with us. And it's my honor to be here in conversation with you. One of the things that I wanna bring forward to everyone is that Jamaica has had an art market for over a hundred years. And you said, well, why would this island, you know, have, have an art market, a robust art market? What is so unique about this small place that would, you know, sort of set the stage for um, this continuum? And we'll talk about these factors, but one of the funny things I was thinking about, there's a, um, an essay by Elizabeth uh, Pigu Dennis. I said, Jamaicans have a continental self-perception that they're the Jamaicans don't feel like we don't feel that islandness. You know, we never refer to ourselves as islanders, and that has a lot to do with psychologically um, why we would be in this space and in the market of self-representation for so long. So to kick off the conversation, um, you know, we are a relational culture, uh, and a lot of what we do and how we deal with each other, whether by city or by country is in relation to our family history and legacy. Who are you the cousin of, the friend of, the sister of? That's, you're never identified as the, you know, sort of urban individual. You are identified by your family. So um, I guess one of my first questions to you, Susie, knowing that this, you're not the first generation in the arts. Can you tell us a little bit about your family story? Uh, sure, thank you for having me. I'm very, very honored to be here also. Um, my family, working class folks. My mother is Jamaican, Chinese Jamaican, Chinese and um, German from Westmoreland. My father's British. He came here in 62 and they married, they must met and married about 10 years later. Um, when in, it was in 1979, um, when I was about to go into high school, that my, my parents decided to, my mom was going to go back to work. Um, and they were <laughs> businesses and the Heiko, Heiko Gallery, um, they just thought that would be a great business to be in. I mean, we didn't, there was not a pre preemption around art necessarily, mm. uh, but there was about culture, you know. Um, <coughs> um, so please, please mute yourselves while the conversation is. Sorry, um, sorry. Thank you guys. <laughs> And so for me, I was about 14, 15, I was spending my summer holidays in the gallery working. I mean, every gallery here really needs, you can't just, you know, art cannot be the only income from the business. So a lot of galleries have a framing capacity, kind of like the bread and butter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was up at five and at the workshop, learning how to frame and do all kinds of things. And um, as was my brother soon after me, and we spent many years, you know, holidays, and that's how we would make our pocket money. And that's how I got, you know, started relationships with artists here. When and that's I've been in love with art, really. I remember the first day, my mom brought in a Carl Abrahams of Moses on the Mountain. And I was, you know, I enjoyed art, but it had never really hit me. And that was the moment it hit me. You know, I must have been about 16. And from then, of course, it's just been, things have changed over time, of course, but it's been, one of the greatest um, joys of my life. And, and then, but also you spent some time in, in London, correct? You mm. recently had a return to Jamaica. Can you share a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I went to university in uh, the UK because of my dad. And um, I worked in the fashion business. I, then I went and did all my kind of post grad education into um, indigenous rights and advocacy. And before I returned, I mean, I had my son, I wanted to come home. 
and raise him here. Um, but I represented photographers in the fashion business. I represented, you know, uh, indigenous organizations on kind of EU platforms. You know, I, I've really developed and quite by accident, I think just the roles I would play is quite facilitative, quite collaborative. I think that's, and it manifests in my work quite naturally. Um, remind me of your question. I've completely. Oh no, that's fine because I was I was just trying to uh, share with uh, our guest a little bit more about your time in the UK and how you ended up back um, in Jamaica. Right. Well, I, I, you want for them. Two years prior to me returning. I'd had my son, I started to work um, at a nonprofit art gallery in Brixton. It's been established at that time for about 30 years. Um, and that's 198, 198 Contemporary Arts and Learning. And I was a deputy director there. And I worked with the director on the exhibitions programming. And there was a lot of um, youth at risk kind of programming um, and skills training. So a lot of film, animation, graphic design, um, you know, there was a, just a, an annual program that would manifest into a big exhibition at the end of the year. And being in Brixton, of course, there was a lot of Caribbean first generation, second generation children. Um, and, you know, you'd have good kids just with too much time on their hands and not enough social services to engage with. And it would, uh, you know, the, the end, they, they loved the program. And uh, it, the party at the end of the exhibition it would be a big sound system on Railton Road and all the families, yeah, would, yeah. parents would be so happy, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that was it. So when I returned, the family business <clears throat> was in a transitionary moment. 128 Gallery had just been, um, was about to open and the timing was kind of perfect. And I came back with my son and because of my experience in the exhibitions and coming back here, um, the programming there was where I began, well, on my, on my return. Fantastic, fantastic. Now fast forward um, <laughs> <laughs> a number of adventures later. Um, yeah. So let's, let's, let's get into the thick of things. Um, you know, we have collectors here, we have people who are curious um, who may, have, may be of Jamaican descent or part of the diaspora, who are interested in the arts, but maybe have not really thought of Jamaican art um, sort of in a collectible way. Um, and knowing there's a robust market, can we talk a little bit about the categories, um, of the preeminent categories of Jamaican art? Because there are very specific places where um, Jamaican art has a legacy and kind of shines. Can we talk a little bit about the categories? Um, sure. I mean, we do it chronologically. You know, we have the prehistory, so called, um, which is the Taino archaeological kind of, and there are collectors that are into Taino artifacts. And the Institute of Jamaica is, you know, is it really documents, and that they have treasures down there that most of us don't see. Um, and then you have a kind of historical, like, like a colonial um, era where you have the likes of J.B. Kidd, Hakewell, Belisario, Robertson, and they were the travelers and they would document and draw um, Jamaican landscapes and scenes. And um, there's that era. And then you kind of move um, into the masters, which sort of started happening in the thirties mm -hmm. um, with Edna Manley in the junior center at the Institute, a lot of, she started art classes there and a lot of young artists in, in those days would gather there and work and get to know each other. The likes of Albert Huey and Ralph Campbell and people like that. <clears throat> and so you have what are, I mean, we're a young country, but we have our masters, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so we have the masters kind of period where there's a real, um, a, a real shift to classical like painting um, and then the generation after that is more the modern, where you have like Osmond Watson, Christopher Gonzalez, which was, although, you know, like the, the, the masters really dealt with, they really worked around uh, landscape, working people. It was really about representing ourselves. Right. Um, the generation after that, when I, I speak of the 70s day, was more radical. It was really about political ideology, there was a, that was a time, you know, it was Michael Manley, Edward Siaga, there was these polarized kind of political positions. 
and um, communism was at one side, capitalism at the other. And, you know, we were, we were fraught and there was Cuba and democratic socialism. And it was a very, a very exciting time. You know, it turned into quite a dangerous time, clearly, you know, with the history. But artistically, you had Eugene Hyde, Harvey Singh, you know, they would all, the work was all, it was all very political. And it turned into works about Rastafarianism, African spirituality, a re-articulation of what Jamaicanness was and could be. It was already begun, mm -hmm. but then this visuality kind of emerged during that time. Um, and then we moved more into the contemporary. So I'd say probably from the 90s mm -hmm. till now, maybe the early 2000s. And then we have a more diverse set of media. Um, you know, the, the, the ideas have changed, practices have changed, and you get a more contemporary practice in the last 15, 20 years. What I found has been really interesting when you think about this legacy and these sort of undulating histories and how things are very um, constantly present. There's like this flattening in terms of um, the ideas that people, I mean, we are a young country and we think about the masters coming forward you know, in the 50s, pretty much, 50s and 60s, that these conversations are, are recent and still happening. And thinking about, you know, even back to Belisario, the idea of identity, you know, and identity being investigated, recycled, revisited, challenged. And now there is this very sort of, um, I'm seeing, you know, like a Jamila Shabur or even a Deborah Anzinger, you have all of these sort of highly conceptual mixed media works that are coming out, mm -hmm. um, but there still is this uh, conversation about visibility when someone who isn't sort of engrossed in the work might find that curious only because you think, oh, well, you know, it is a, you know, a black nation, you know, essentially from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, what outsiders think. And can you talk a little bit about what the contemporary artists today that you're working with, which, some, which are some of the most exciting, are generally, I know everyone, you know, has a different practice, but there are some um, themes that are rising to the top. Can you speak to that a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, themes that tend to arise. I mean, it's difficult because they're, they're so, you know, it's, it's hard to draw some, a commonality. Mm -hmm. um, agenda, gender identity, um, ideas around masculinity, femininity, what it means to be this in this world today. Mm -hmm. um, migration, displacement, you know, as kind of secondary migration, um, anxieties in the post, I, I, I don't really love to use the word post-colonial because we're so far post-colonial. Mm -hmm. We need a new word for this time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but there are anxieties, you know, um, if you're outside of the mainstream norm, there's anxieties about conforming um, or being seen or being in danger. And there's this sense of, um, there's, an omin not, there's an ominous sense mm -hmm. to some of the work for that reason. Absolutely. I and mean, even when you look at someone like Ebony Patterson, who, you know, because of the Perez Art Museum show, I'm going to assume so many of the people on this um, Zoom might have seen it you know, and just thinking about the beauty in her work. But when you really dig into her work, it is very dark, it is very ominous. Um, so that juxtaposition between um, that beauty and the shadow tends to be uh, a major theme coming out of the space, even though you, well, you won't want to flatten the work, but there's, you know. Well, you know, Jamaica exists in this kind of juxtaposition where we are, you know, there's one set of people that love to brand Jamaica. You know, we're here to market ourselves as a tropical, Kind of paradise and of course as any Jamaica knows the reality is very different you know surviving here living here um, requires a whole different skill set <laughs> you know? yeah and I think um, I think that 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 I think artists feel that because now these days you know they have more access to like travel you know move around be in different spaces and navigate themselves in that way um, and so there is this sense that we, we realize we're seductive. I mean, Susie Wong, I chose that name because there's a sense of that in there too. It's the seducing right. of the West, you know? Right. Um, and yet the darkness of that is really just that we have realities and truths that are not really seen in a, in a marketing campaign. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we're I mean, for all the things that we used to discriminate against, like Rastafarianism, and, 
in the ads, but you know, in the thirties, right up until I would say recently. Uh, today? Yeah. Just a couple months ago when dreadlocks were banned in school. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. There was that. <laughs> <laughs> there was that. Or, you know, what's really interesting, um, I don't remember the name of this phenomenon, but um, when I was home recently, the constant churn of the sound system, but the sound systems are related to the funerary process now. Mm -hmm. So it's like a daytime night night. Um, I don't know if everyone knows what a night night is, but you know, when thinking about old funeral tradition, um, especially still in the country, there is a singing and dancing that takes place all night. And it's tied to African tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a rendition of that now that includes a sound system and it sounds like a bashment but in fact, it is a funeral. And it's very disconcerting when you hear that sound every 15, 20 minutes and realize that it's a funeral procession, you know? Um, so there is that element that, that when you are outside of the sort of tourist scape, um, it, is, it is quite pal palpable. So mm -hmm. speaking of that, um, talk about markets for a moment. Mm -hmm. You know, markets, <clears throat> as we all know, are normally catalyzed by very specific um, events. Um, so if we're, I don't wanna go all the way back, but let's say if we're starting around um, independence, um, thinking about sort of the key things um, that have happened, let's say over the last uh, 60 years in terms of, of events that have catalyzed either sparking the market or crushing a market. Do you want to talk to um, a few of those events to give people some sort of grounding as to how uh, things have been going? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, I will go back to the 70s <laughs> because that was the establishment of the uh, National Gallery of Jamaica in 1974, which has really been key mm -hmm. um, to developing a kind of art ecology. Mm -hmm. um, not always successfully, or, you know, there have been challenges and conflicts and things like that. Um, but I would say uh, there were three seminal kind of exhibitions that were done there. Um, and in 1939, wait, hold on, I have them noted here. Um, they are, they were key in establishing a kind of historical survey of Jamaican art. And then it moved into Jamaican art 1922 to, I think, 1940. Um, and that was a time that was all that established Edna Manley kind of as a symbolic beginning, right? You know, um, with the junior center and everything developing from there. Um, and then there was the Intuitive Eye, which I think was in 1978. I don't know. I think it was around then, and that that established a genre around the intuitives. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the intuitives is a, is a is a name coined by David Boxer, who is the chief curator at the National Gallery for many many years and decades. Um, it, it, it's um, a contested word, um, but it's not a folk tradition when you think about the context mm -hmm. of not bringing tradition. These are, these are artists who have really, you know, it's their own. It comes from somewhere of, of, of a consciousness, right. but it's their own. There's no, there no skills, you know, generationally traded down. Um, I would say in 1963, you know, Eugene Hyde, Carl Parbu Singh and Barrington Watson they formed the Contemporary Jamaica Artists Association and that they wanted to formalize a kind of contemporary feeling to Jamaican art. Um, I know collectors were very involved with that. Well, people that loved art. I mean, I don't really like to call people collectors until they call themselves a collector, you know, right. but it's people that love art, people that enjoy the work, people that like being around, create, you know, artists that are producing work and positioning work around political ideas. It's a way to talk about things. And it's a way to live with your own um, ethos, with the work that you're drawn to, you know? Yeah. And I really think it comes from a soulful kind of place, for the most part, some buy for investment. But I think in those days, there was an excitement about um, the whole notion of identity, um, what was Jamaicanness, who we were, and there were all these different ideas about all those things. Right, and then just to even cycle back to, to two of the things. I mean, the first thing I want to cycle back to is to the intuitives, the idea of the intuitives, you know, in the States and in Europe, people call it outsider art. And, you know, I'm always very cautious and about language. Um, I think there's something that 
is inherently sort of open and gracious and respectful of, of spirit and tradition in the language of intuitive. Um, and it was something that we didn't mention, but knowing that you currently have an online exhibition at, Artly, at Artsy um, featuring Jamaican intuitive, well, Caribbean intuitive artists and understanding that in the Jamaican framework and marketplace, this is a very important category because identity was very much an important part of how we formulated um, our culture. And just to talk about that a little bit more, what a lot of people don't know or may not know, I don't wanna make assumptions, may not know is really understanding once um, not just the Manleys, um, but even Bustamante coming into office uh, and, and leading into um, independence. It was almost a governmental mandate uh, to look at literature and the arts and science. So this is not only something that was brought forward from the people, but it was part of uh, a nationwide cultivation of self mm -hmm. and definition of self. And this is why these practices are so respected. And it's, we call it a market now because with even like someone like yourself, or like myself, bringing these conversations forward into a global dialogue. Um, I think we have to be careful um, about the consumptive nature of sort of American collecting or Western collecting and understanding that um, we're collecting culture and sort of promoting culture versus um, looking for, you know, sort of only value, you know, so, or only sort of investment. and. I'm just trying to be careful around um, that and having a sense of a sense of center when people are entering the um, entering the conversation. And what I found is because the collecting community is really small, or the art buying community is really small in terms of these sort of seminal works and supporting some of the talented um, artists that are coming out of Jamaica or out of the diaspora. I just really want to shout out two people here, um, Shoshana Weinberger, who is my heart, um, mm -hmm. and Onika Russell, who is extraordinarily talented, who I met a couple months ago. Um, you know, we have to, we are excited, but we're also championing, you know, our culture, not just um, the marketplace. So that kind of segues into how is work typically collected on the island? How do people go, up, especially with the fact that there aren't that many galleries. So can you talk a little bit about what that culture looks like? Do I assume it's centered in Kingston? Can you tell us a little bit about that landscape? Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> a huge question. Um, people collect in different ways. Um, I think, you know, Certainly locally, 2008, uh, I think with the recession, the global recession, it really kind of shifted everything locally. Mm -hmm. So um, people that would buy art um, ebbed away or got older or, you know, did, changed their habits. Mm -hmm. Younger generations <clears throat> were not engaging in the same way. And I think as uh, certainly for me, um, with the advent of social media, and this access that you can, we can all have from the islands now to each other, to relationships, to networking, you know, to common kind of interests and goals. Um, that is where the new life is. You know, in Kingston, like, you know, there was a show that opened today at the Olympia Gallery, mm -hmm. um, curated by Philip Thomas, who's a, a, a great, one of our really good contemporary artists here. Um, it's the first art show I've seen for like maybe, and, and the pandemic aside, maybe, mm -hmm. a, you know, a year and a half, two years, mm -hmm. like a really, you know, good, good contemporary survey. Um, so we, we lack spaces. I mean, there are things that are lacking locally in terms of physical, physical spaces to see work, access to artists. You know, we don't really have a studio, um, part of the ecology purely because of the cost and it's prohibitive. So artists really manage to produce incredible work, you know, without much access to anything. Collectors, they have to, or people that want to get into collecting, and certainly the people that are with me, mm -hmm. I have a handful locally, um, um, diaspora, international, and that that's that's why I'm just, the work I'm doing is mm -hmm. kind of looking more outward because mm -hmm. the value is seen. Um, 
from outside more than internally. Right. I'm hoping that will change, but I think it's really about um, access to, to, to these, you know, to, to the artists themselves and the work. It's very difficult if you don't. Whereas on social media, there's a lot of access. You can see work, you can see studios, you know, you can yeah. see practice, you know? And then the other side is, I mean, this wasn't on my, you know, list of questions, but as you were saying that, and like I mentioned, um, sort of Onika's in, so our conversation is kind of bubbling up in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the artists that, you know, sort of people are finding, I mean, I obviously am, you know, encouraging people to reach out to you um, and you have a relationship with these, with the artists, but in terms of um, social media and things like that, um, what are the risks involved from a, a price point? Um, you know, dealing with artists making assumptions about market rate or, or cost. Can we talk a little bit, not about the numbers, but really what the expectation should be when collecting contemporary art from artists who are on the island versus who are in the States? Because one of the things that worries me is even within the Caribbean, you know, diaspora, there is assumptions made about, um, value. So can you talk a little bit about value and, and price points as you see them today? Sure. Um, I think locally, and I think perhaps in other islands as well, probably afflicted with the same issue. Um, as an economy, it's just a small economy, you know, and people can only pay so much, afford mm -hmm. so much, or are willing to spend so much because they don't see the value beyond the local. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when you have artists that can access markets in the global north, or I'm hoping soon, like in the African market, you know, that kind of exchange needs to be kind of networked and developed, um, that it will have to work the other way around. When they see artists work selling for like, you know, what the true value is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I won't do numbers either, but like, you know, really paid properly for the work they're doing to, yeah. so that they can have a livelihood and some security you know, and, and they're, you know, develop a career, a long-term yeah. career of yeah. practice. Um, and I think that's the way it's going to go. The challenge is, is having people understand the global art world and how it works in that way. Right. And, uh, they have to be interested in that journey. I mean, I've spoken to a couple of bankers saying, hey, you know, you should really look at this artist, that artist. And now I tend not to push it because they just look at me like I'm a little crazy <laughs> like art you know like why that we've never the, the return they would get would never you know be worthwhile um and I don't I don't take it any further I'm just going to do the work do what I do support artists the best way I can I mean I don't do representational um work um project to project just so that it can be flexible and responsive and as things come up I can you know I can work with what's in the present moment Right, right. Which, yeah. which is which is the dream, you know. I, it's so funny. I really just uh, <laughs> wrote an essay about the project, so I'm gonna have to send that to you. Um, we do have we do have uh, you know one question in the chat. I just wanted everyone to know that we are definitely going to um, get to questions soon. Um, what two more questions I have for you, uh, Susie? Someone is coming from the outside outside of reaching out to you directly. Um, if someone is, is coming to Jamaica and looking to buy work, um, how would, or how would you advise them to, you know, start approaching the process um, or approaching artists? Um, I think, yeah, you know, you gotta do your research before you get here. Um, I think, you know, we have a couple of really good books on Jamaican art. One's called Jamaican art, one's called Modern Jamaican art. Um, I would say you definitely have to go to the National Gallery. You have to buy some catalogs or look online. Um, there are archives where you can, um, you can look at, if you want to know the history, if you're more interested in the contemporary, then you find out who's, who's, who's in the- um, Who's in the know? Well, no, who, well, I'm not me. Either. I'm just joking. <laughs> I didn't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, not me. Right. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, we do have two commercial galleries that are still going strong, but, you know, it's quite limited. You'd have to, NLS is a really wonderful um, initiative locally, uh, new local space, Deborah Anzinger um, runs that. They're doing really important work. 
Uh, they don't always, it's by appointment, they don't always have a show going, but I would go there, look at their library, um, look at their programming, uh, get in touch with me. And you know, if you want artist visits, I mean, Deborah could help with that. And you just have to link in with the right kind of community. There are certain key people that are very fluent with what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, people do want to share it, you know, with people that are interested. So it's really about tapping into right people in the right community and, um, and doing some reading. So you know what you're interested in before you right. get here. Um, and just, you know, as a warning, um, there is such a great intellectualism in Jamaica in terms of a tradition, um, looking at the Stuart Halls, looking at Edna Manley College and people coming out of that space. Oh, um, Edna Manley, that, that would be a place to go. Mm -hmm. um, my advice to anyone interested um, is to do your homework. I would not advise you to walk into this cold <laughs> at all. Um, it, it's a lot of intellectual fun, but it is, um, to be an artist in Jamaica today, um, for most of the artists is a very brave endeavor and it's taken very seriously. And um, I just hope that anyone who would want to take that leap would, as, as uh, Susan said, uh, Suzanne said, excuse me, um, that, you know, do your homework. So in our, in our last question, um, what, would, what do you see as the future of the Jamaican slash Caribbean art market? Um, I'll preface this by saying Caribbean here. Um, I know I tend to be hyper-focused on Jamaica um, and I've spent a lot of time seeing the uh, Cuban art market develop in a market space. Uh, when I was at Phillips, one of the top collectors um, really sort of, he had his own publications and really sort of orchestrated the presence of um, Cuban art in the broader um, global market. And I understand how it was done. So for me, while I see the Caribbean coming into, you know, the fore and conversation and people are getting curious, you know, I personally am focused on Jamaica, but you, you know, you definitely have a reach um, that goes across, you know, Anglophone, Francophone, you know, Latin, you know, Spanish speaking islands. Um, so can you speak to the Caribbean as a whole? Like, what are you seeing now? Uh, well, I think in the past five years, especially, certainly for me, that's kind of doing the work I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a possibility for the region, like if we can have, if we can have a feeling of cohesion, mm -hmm. we have the common history, but such diverse development, you know? Um, not just the colonial influences, but the, you know, the political kind of systems and which way we go and, um, and who is still, you know, considered a colony and things like that. So um, there is an opportunity um, with so many artists from the region going into these global North markets and, and really seeing success and continued success. Mm -hmm. I think it's really a moment um, for a possibility for the younger ones to, to, to be able to access that and to be seen mm -hmm. um, as a region. You know, it, when you look at the international art market, it's, it's Asia, you know, it's, right. it's regional, right. it's Latin. You know, and so it's been difficult for us because we have all this fragmentation as islands. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with social media and the internet, you know, we just have so much more access to each other. Those conversations can happen. Mm -hmm. How it will manifest, I'm not really sure. I know it has to be strategic. Right. Well, I, you know, it's an exciting time. Um, I think there are a lot of factors that are moving it forward. And, you know, there's so much more to discuss without question. Um, I do want to um, move on to the Q&A portion um, at this point. And George uh, asked a question, George Fishman asked a question. Can you please talk about the currents embracing Pan-African, I mean, Pan-Caribbean, excuse me, spirit and the impulse for each island to champion their own, which I think you touched upon. Mm -hmm. Is there also a dynamic whereby artists uh, need to establish themselves outside of the island before they're properly respected back home? Um, Both great questions, George, thank you. Yeah, great questions. I'll take the second one as I touched on the first. Mm -hmm. um, I would say no, I think they're valued here. 
you know, um, by a small community, but certainly by me. I mean, the artists that are um, now making headway in other markets um, have always had strong support locally, but it might just be, it's not gonna be like popular culture, you know, mm -hmm. um, like music or anything like that. But no, I'd say they're very valued at home. Um, it really is, again, a bit strategic as to how you archive that, how you document that, how do you make that apparent to people looking in, you know? Absolutely. And it's, and it's funny to piggyback on what you said. And I just want to go to my first point about Jamaica. I can't speak to other islands. I have a little Trini and a little Barbados and a little Haiti. And those are my other, you know, my other um, ancillary uh, sort of interests. Mm -hmm. But it also speaks to just the proud nationalistic kind of culture that we have. Because when you look at other markets, like, for example, um, it's very typical that that happens in Mexico. You know, Mexico City has extraordinary artists and they can't sell in Mexico City because the collectors in Mexico City want to buy in Miami or, you know, or in South America. So you have this kind of, um, this reverse trip and then happens the same way in sort of even regional pockets within the U in United States. Oh, if you haven't made it in New York or same thing, um, with uh, Europe and other places. So um, I think it is kind of unique that we do have sort of this pocketed support system that might not be as flush with, um, you know, American dollars or capital um, as other global markets, but it is robust and it is passionate um, mm -hmm. for sure. Is there anyone else who has a question for us? Just pop in, you could take yourself off mute. <laughs> if you'd like. Um, hey, Mark, how are you? So Mark McIntosh is here. And when I was talking about the friend who brought me to AC Hotel, um, that was that was the gent. <laughs> hey, Mark. I so Mark, thank you for it. Thank you for being the catalyst um, for that. And um, uh, everyone's being a little shy. So um, I am going to wrap. But what I will say is, please look up uh, Susie's exhibition and presentation um, at prismartfair.com. Um, look out for announcements um, coming from me. If you want to reach out, it's hello at yard-concept.com. You can join our ma mailing list. Um, we are launching a new um, Jamaica Focus program in January. Um, so there's a lot happening and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Mikhail, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for having us. And Su Suzanne, thank you very much. Pleasure, oh. you too. Did somebody, I think, oh, somebody just asked a question. Um, uh, following up to your comments about inside and outside, how about artists who live abroad? Are they equally embraced by Jamaican collectors? Ooh. Well, well, they need to come down to an issue of access. I mean, you know, when they're abroad, how, how are, unless local, I mean, are you talking local art lovers or collectors, you know? Um, it all depends how it's communicated, but sometimes no, but I mean, they are valued in the sense of if they're recognized as, you know, increasing value over there, people know about it, but they don't necessarily have access to see the work. And the, and the other thing is that, you know, the kind of peculiar nuance about the island is, connectivity. And yes, I, I do think um, Susie let me know if this is correct, but you know, he was asking about Jamila, who, you know, I'm a big fan of Jamila Shabor's work. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it has a lot to do with investment. And I think this goes back to even what I said before about starting to collect work um, in Jamaica. I think there's just a cultural pride and respect for uh, personal investment. Um, in the culture? Do you show up? Are you being seen? Are you doing the work? Are you, or is it, I think everyone is a little bit um, sensitive to the idea of extraction. You know, we're a culturally robust um, nation and culture, and it's very easy for um, things to be extracted out, but not sort of returned in. And I think that that's a, a very sort of subtle dynamic, but a real one. Um, that I think we're always kind of negotiating in negotiating the spectrum of our Jamaicanness, for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Any, any, that was another that was another good question. Are, are, are you all sure there's no more questions? I have to make sure that George shows up to all of the all of the conversation. <laughs> ah, ah. See, George started a trend. There's another question. So here, um, are there Jamaican um art are there are Jamaica artists works sold on the secondary market? Oh, of course. Okay. We have a robust secondary market. Um we have auctions, I would say probably more regularly than recently. I mean, it's kind of tapered off. I think um, the last one was a David Boxer estate auction. Um, but yeah, the secondary market is, is quite robust and there are people that um, collectors know each other. You know, they trade works, they might say, hey, you know, I've been wanting this forever. What do you want for me to, you know, let's do a, let's do a trade or um, they want something particularly to kind of like bring into the collection and then they'll contact someone like me and um, I'll know who owns work elsewhere. And, you know, that, that's where I kind of advise and try and, and try and help collectors, you know, build their collections in ways they want to. Fantastic. Anyone else? Don't be shy. <laughs> I guess I have a follow-up question to that too. Um, because really, um, and I think most artists would, would agree, the secondary market is not, not the goal. Um, so how, how, do, how do we prevent, how do we get, get the, the Caribbean art market in a place where it consistently participates on the primary market um, and like the secondary market is like this very, very last resort sort of situation versus it being almost oh. like an immediate pass through to the secondary market. Can I respond to that, Susie? Yes. Sure. Um, <laughs> so when she was mentioning the secondary market, what I would, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is what we're talking about are masters. We're not talking about the flipping of emerging artists, right? So, you yeah. know, because, yes, because we're talking about a lot of times artists who have passed on, um, artwork that is part of, uh, you know, that have been part of collections or estates where the owners have passed on, or you have, you know, I remember, um, you know, there was this big capo thing in my family that everybody wanted this one capo that was at someone's house for the longest time. You know, it is, it is definitely not um, from the standpoint of flipping and um, making money on an artist's work that's not part of the sort of ethos right now. So it's a little different than what's happening here. What I would say about in response to that, Mikhail, is that I do think, you know, I'm a strong believer in the royalty resale rights of artists. And that's where the secondary market could, could provide, um, a, you know, financial benefit for them long term, because, you know, the work values because of the work they do. And I really believe in the primary market um that there i know it's it's law it's very hard to enforce even as, but i think as a as a policy is what i'm considering taking on in the sales agreements of the emerging artists i work with because the more i do it and then i'm working the secondary market um and we might not have a flipping culture but we certainly have, might have someone that has a company g patterson and wants to sell mm -hmm. and it goes to the it goes to a u.s collector um there's really no there's no you know, there's, no, there's nothing in that for the artist. And there's something really unjust about that to my mind. And I would like to, I think that's where the secondary market could match the primary market in terms of the context Mikhail is speaking to, mm -hmm. like be, be, you know, be important for the artist. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, knowing that like in the, in the UK with auctions, that there is, you know, there are policies that have percentage um, kickbacks going to the artist it has not been enforceable in the US. Um, so that is that has continuously been an auction-based tension here. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> so it is something to get ahead of. <laughs> ideal. And I think it's something you can develop as a conversation with collectors or people right. that want it seriously. Um, because if they really love the work and value the work, they will value the artists long-term and longevity, you know. I would I would advocate. Let's put it that way. Um, so Sarah 
I think had asked about repatri repatriation, um, you know, as it turns uh, to, you know, sort of African um, artifacts and um, First Nation artifacts going back to their original countries. Um, there was something, um, was it earlier this year or maybe last year, a Ministry of Culture from Jamaica was yeah. looking for our Taino works. Um, so yes, yeah, so do you want to speak to that? Yeah. So the, uh, repatriation of those are underway. I know they've made the request to the British Museum for those. Um, uh, I think another interesting layer to that question is, you know, really important work um, that you would love to be part of a national collection, actually be part of private collections mm -hmm. uh, by the Jamaican diaspora or people that collect around um, Caribbean work. Um, and that repatriation would have to be gifts to the nation. <laughs> I think there, there was there was another question that Jackie Brown had. Um, what do you think about um, more on the ground efforts to recognize community art makers such as Goat Curry Gallery um, on Instagram? Well, Anya, that's Anya Freer. She mm -hmm. does Goat Curry Gallery. I love her work. Um, she's she's quite well recognized. I mean, certainly locally. Uh, she's been in the National Gallery Summer Show last year. Um, she has a very strong presence on IG. She's been part of, I think, a couple of other programs in the US based. Um, I do understand what you mean. She had a fabulous show. She got, she, um, she got a curatorial fellowship at NLS, and this is where their work is really important. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, she curated a show um, around some of the people that she films. Um, who are artisans, craft makers. And it was a really beautiful show and it resonated with a lot of people and there was good documentation and she did some writing about it. Um, so I would say she's, you know, she's, she's well recognized locally and I think in the social media space, how to translate that into interest um, beyond that would again, you know, take some strategy and some networking. Mm -hmm. Right, and then, and then to jump into that a little bit, when you think about um, also uh, organizations like Kingston Creative, yeah. um, who are, you know, as a group aggressively putting forward um, creative opportunity from mural to graphic design to, you know, self-taught artists, you know, so there is um, a lot going on just because again the fact that there is a national culture that is is supportive of the arts Com there could always be more support but comparatively in terms of other countries even when you think of what's happened from a governmental standpoint in the US um, you know there is that support and respect and um, love of uh, sort of the community-based practices. So I think it's really about having a healthy range and it depends on what the artist's desires are. Not every artist is interested in competing in a global marketplace as well. And sort of we have to be respectful of that um, too. Yeah, very true. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's another question, uh, secondary market sales at auction versus private sales, uh, DT Ray had asked about um, secondary market sales at auction. Do, mm -hmm. do these works, specifically sort of the more historic works, show up um, on the auction market? I don't have recollection of that, so I would love to turn that to you, Susie. Um, it depends what you mean by historical works. I mean, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you will get at the Manly, you get some colonial kind of, you know, era um, antique prints from like 1700s, maps, etc. cetera. Um, but then at these auctions, they're usually, you know, kind of <clears throat> rather than like the big, that like Phillips would have like a contemporary auction, a modern, you know, we have ours all in one. So you'll have like a collection <clears throat> into the modern, into contemporary, then intuitive, and then, you know, um, so there are different groups of work within it. Um, I'm talking, when I speak about a secondary market, I do mean both. I mean, I'm, I, I was talking about both previously. <clears throat> and au auctions generally are, they do very well. You know, we don't have them often, which is part, part of why they do well. Because <laughs> the market's too small, you know, um, and they have to be curated in a sense as well. 
to try and meet what people, what you think people might be interested in. Got it. And I think we have um, one more question. I think, George, I'm going to uh, jump into your um, last question. It's to Susie. Susie, George wants to know, do you sometimes sell entirely online? I do, especially during the pandemic. <laughs> The recent show I did on Artsy was uh, on the intuitive work was uh, called Still Life. Um, and that was entirely online, but my database is mixed, you know? So my buyers were, I would say probably half and half. It's a very popular genre locally. Um, and that did very well. And that was entirely online. I know it's, um, my ideal scenario would be a hybrid of that. And I would have a physical show, not just the pandemic, but the cost of doing that and the risk you take because the market here is kind of weaker than it used to be. It's almost like, you know, I know the traction will happen more online with the clientele that can see in that way. Fantastic. So on that note, again, please visit Susie <laughs> Wong Presents on prismartfair.com. Thank you so Check much. Me at yard-concept.com. Mikhail, thank you for having us. Susie, thank you for your wisdom and um, all of your great work. And thank you, friends, for joining us. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you guys so much. I've enjoyed it. And just a quick, um, uh, I guess, re recap of what we have coming up um, tomorrow. So you can actually, if you're interested in um, the film that's screening now, it's called When Liberty Burns. You can actually go to the link on our website. And um, I think it's like a small $5 fee to watch to watch it on Eventive. Um, and it's about um, the 40th anniversary of the passing of um, Arthur McDuffie, um, who was tragically uh, murdered um, here during the civil rights era in Miami. Um, and then we're gonna have a subsequent panel talk um, tomorrow with the filmmaker Dudley Alexis, um, Nadej Green, who is a local journalist and um, storyteller here in Miami. And then um, one of Miami's, um, actually she's from Trinidad and Tobago originally, but she's based in Miami. She's a photographer named Johan Rahman, who is essentially a black life archivist. Um, she takes photographs of um, African Americans here in, in Florida. Um, so if you uh, just, if you haven't um, received our newsletter, you can go to our newsletter and all the links for all of that information.